jolly miners listen to my song about my journey o'er the plains it will not take you long the 14th day of May the spring of 62 all things being ready I bid my friends adieu left my home in Iowa to run and read and sow and I started for the west to take a trip across the plains bound for Salmon River that boasted a land of gold to try to make a fortune as other had been told. Our journey it was pleasant. We traveled up the black. The country it was beautiful, although it's rather flat. We saw many things beautiful to behold. We crossed over the plains in search for the gold. There was Chimney Rock, the ancient rock independence too. Many other sites that were beautiful to view. At length we got to Laramie, thought the time would never come. And there we got some letters from the dear ones at home. This is a very rare song. But one of only a couple I've ever seen that actually talked about experiences on the Oregon Trail. You can find books and books of songs that were sung on the Oregon Trail, but for some reason, after people got through all those experiences and got to California or Oregon or Idaho or wherever, they didn't write the songs down. It's not odd. Out near Pacific Springs, we took the land around the rough mountain road. As we afterwards found out, the mountains were very high and the road very rough. Snow in the month of August to make us very tough. There were many persons killed by engines on the way, but we were on our guard by night and by day. Though we seen the bloody work to others they had done, yet wisely for themselves they left us alone. And now on Powder River we have landed safe and sound, with our pick and shovels will be digging up the ground. While the boys in Iowa must go and fight the war. We'll stay here till the water comes, then we'll be all right. And when the war is over and our fortunes we have won, then we'll have no use for our pick and our spade. Here's to the girls who wait, they wait for us to come, and then we shall see the dear ones at home. guy that came out on the Oregon Trail um, to get rich in the new gold finds in Idaho. And uh, he never, I don't think he ever actually got to go to, to the salmon mines. Instead, he became a newspaper editor. Come on, what happened here? Got to get this thing going here. Instead, he became a newspaper editor here in the Wallowas, and uh, wrote up the story of his coming to this area. Give me a second here to get this thing beaten into soup for submission here. Well, you're not. No, it's just a, I think that's a little it has a mind of itself sometimes. At any rate, um, so why am I here? I'm here because I want to find songs pre-1924 when radio came to this part of the uh, of the world. Because I'm working on a project on, on Hell's Canyon region, a CD and booklet project, just like those ones I have over there that I've done before in Idaho. And Hell's Canyon to me is everything that brings into Hell's Canyon. Most of that's actually Oregon, not Idaho because the distance between the Seven Devils Range and, and the river is like straight down. So, uh, I'm here I'm hoping to show you some of the songs and poems I look for, and maybe you have something like that, or maybe you have a very compelling story that could be turned into a song, so I'm always looking for people that are uh, willing and able to do that as well. So let's continue more or less chronologically, this is a poem that came right from the uh, research library next door here. 
It was written in 1922 by Miss Delight Flossen. And David, where is she, she from? Enterprise. She, she was from Enterprise. I think she was a high school student at the time, right? And uh, she's talking about the pioneers coming out to the area. It goes like this. Toward the sunset splendor, a tiny black speck moves. It creeps across the valley, and it's lost in the purpling woods. The night wind toys with a canvas, covers a wagon high, and a coyote mourns to the silhouette of his mate against the sky. Not bad for a, a, a high school girl, huh, from Enterprise. Now from a blazing campfire come the sounds of a busy life. A partridge is shot by the father and cooked by his sad-eyed wife. Sad-eyed? Ah, oh, yes, but within her is the fire of courage true. Then folds the whole of the family and spurs them to dare and do. At last the supper's over and the children tucked away, the guards all set for Indians, and the cattle picketed by. A hush of slumber settles, but, long, but not long by the flickering fire, the father paces and paces as he can't tire. What stirs him so? Is he fearful? Does he dread an Indian lure? Does he dream of a threatening famine? Oh no, there's a greater commotion that stirs his breast tonight. He is sure, yes, he is sure that he knows that the Wallawa Mountains are in sight. Long has he sought, long has he struggled, long has he braved and had faith. Heavy and thick with the dangers and the trail with a dim shadowed path. But now, thank God, here is his deed. A home for his wandering brood. The streams, the mountains, and valleys will furnish them all with their food. But what if the red man threaten? Well, safe in his home he will be. And the plow will sink deep in the furrow as his axe plunges deep in the tree. His sons will shoot to manhood, his daughters to womanhood sweet, and the wagon of more pioneers will follow the path of his feet. The village will grow to a city, the trails to broad, smooth road, and 10,000 farmers will carry their priceless loads. Then the grand old veil of Lalao will ring with the shouts of men, though the red man buries his hatchet and the coyote slinks through his den. Such was the dream of the father as he paced by the fire that night, and the dreams have come true as he planned them in this valley of peace and light. But oh, can we ever bring tribute? Can we ever enough praises give to those first brave, brave men and women who came to this valley to live? Wow. I say, not bad for a 16-year-old girl, probably. No so we're going to go back to the Idaho side now. And this is a poem uh, in a book by Oriana Hubbard Martin about an 1878 event. And she was her, with her family doing laundry there on the creek that goes through uh, Council Idaho. How many know where Council Idaho is? Some of you. Well, you gotta go, <laughs> as a buzzer flies, it's probably 40 miles. As you drive, it's probably 200 to get there. And this is about how uh, they did laundry back in those days. Long before you oped your eyes in the early spring of 78, when I of kindergarten size was in a distant state, from then to middle 80s, women of Council Vale on Monday morns betook themselves to down the river trail. Four women, heads of families, six maidens fleeing after, six dogs arranging far afield, four boys with shouts and laughter. Those were the Winkler boys from Virginia. Though they two brazen kettles bore a 20 gallon measure, they soon were running far before with hoops of boyish pleasure. And soon upon the sandy beach, a big campfire was blazing. Each council of human eye could reach showed industry amazing. The boys were dipping water up and keeping the kettles boiling. The women rubbing out the clothes with no effect of toiling. The little girls with frying pans warmed up with baked beans for dinner. And each one had his happy task, as sure as I'm a sinner. <laughs> Cooperative? I'd say it was. Community endeavor. Although perhaps it had no name till it was or forever. 
But think of it on Monday mornings when you turn on your power to do a family washing in just an hour. Think of the lonely housewives in early council veil hastening with their offspring down the river trail. Thank you. So, um, how many of you know about the uh, massacre of the Chinese in uh, Hell's Canyon? Very gruesome story. And um, for those who don't know the story, 1887, uh, 30 or maybe more essentially unarmed Chinese placer miners uh, in the bottom of Hell's Canyon, in the vicinity of Doug Bar, um, were killed by some rogue cowboys who spent most of their time on this side of the river, on the Oregon side. And they were run by a, an old guy named Old Blue, that was his nickname. And eventually, uh, Old Blue and his ringleaders were caught, but uh, they escaped jail, and Old Blue, it is said, lived the rest of his life in Texas making horseshoes. Uh, this song, I found many variations of this song, our Captain Old Blue, and it was said to be written by a guy named Ike Bear, which I don't know anything about, but David here says he has some information about him, looking forward to learning about that. Uh, but the amazing thing about this song, there are like 15, at least 16 verses I found, I'll only do a few of them. Um, the only one verse in all of those actually mentions the Chinese being massacred. The rest of it is about these guys being bad dudes because of the horse and cattle thieves. And it just speaks volumes for the sentiments at the time. So uh, as to the melody of uh, Black Dreary Black Hills, this was shortly after the Black Hills gold discovery was found. And a song was written, and, and so these melodies get transported amazingly fast from one place to another, even back in those days when it was hard to get from the Black Hills of South Dakota to uh, <laughs> the bottom of Hell's Canyon.
the officers were coming, not for men that they slew. They caught and bound over their captain, Old Blue. Well, if you want to learn more about that event, there's a, a well-documented book written maybe 10 years ago about the whole event. And uh, you know, not one of the uh, glorious incidents to have happened in, in, in this part of the West. So that's the kind of song I'm looking for. That's the five-star song for me, but only happened here. And every, every line in that song just about has significance if you understand uh, the context of the time and the place they're talking about. We're going to move over to uh, back across the river again. This time to Indian Valley, which is the valley just east of the Weezer Valley. And uh, this song appeared in the Weezer Leader newspaper, April 3rd, 1891. And uh, it's kind of a tour de force of cowboy. So, uh, as, I, as I say here, only a cowboy could have written a, a song like this. We'll swing the whip and dash the spur, be a gallon rover, for a cowboy's life is a wildlife sir, riding the wild plains over, through the winter storm and summer sun, we follow our vocation, and though our work is seldom done, we still have recreation, and then show your skill and courage now, take a that weezer cow, the one that ran behind you. Our roundup in the month of May, we have pleasant weather, may well be called our muster day, for the boys have come together. We look for earmarks, do laps to France most insignificant, and the boys should read and translate well, mysterious hieroglyphic, and then show your skill and courage now. Take a look behind you, turn and chase that Joseph cow. A chance to show true pluck and skill, fun for the gallant ranger. Our ponies follow with the bill, out with through good shine. And the rider too must bounce him, or on the ground be lying. Though show your skill and courage now, take a look behind you. Turn and chase that enterprise cow, the one that ran behind. in the big corral, through that leery of Shirley, and way down the stairs for the grand and iron, and high his feet securely. So show your skill and courage now, take a look behind you, turn and chase that villain turning down. Oh, we'll swing the whip and dash the spur, be a gallant and a rover, for the cowboy's life is a wild blesser, riding the wild plains over, from year to year our duty pleasures for us, then swing your old wool hat boys, sing the cowboy chorus, then show your skill and courage now, take a look behind you, turn and chase that paper cow, one that ran behind first uh, state senator from that part of Idaho 
elected to the first legislature as a socialist, by the way. And he wrote a, an amazing 130-page book of psalms and poetry, and he published it, published it in 1895 in the Weezer newspaper. So, uh, I'm going to do a couple songs and poems that he published back then. I'm hoping to find a source book like that from the Wallowas. It would be worth a trip just for that alone we could find that. Maybe somebody did that. Who knows? Come on, you bold adventures, and listen to my song about the seven devils. Mind. I will not keep you long. Those wines of wealth that's lately found slay the rich or bright. And millions of beneath the ground as round as see your life. And when you pack your old cayuse, start to make a race. And stop upon that grassy plot, let that equine graze. You're liable at any time to meet a rattle bug. And don't forget the old snake bite cure. Don't forget the old snake bite cure in the old brown dug. And big boys big, let us the rich or fine. And open up in handsome style the seven devils mine. So he would sing these songs around campfires at the mining camp, seven, seven devils. And when you reach the devil's mine, all filled with wind and gush, don't mope about and hang your head, you'd make those devils blush. And shoulder up your pick and pan, take your shovels too. And when you strike a rich or vain, just pop the devil through. Oh, big boys, big, let us the rich or fine. And open up in St. Paul's style, and let the devil's mine. You can sing along with you right here. See down there on the bottom. And when the rock becomes so dark, you can no longer pick. Don't hang your head and look so sour and make those devils sick. And seize your drill and hammer too, put down a four foot pole. And charge your bow with dynamite and let the thunder roll. Dig, boys, dig, and let us rip to a fine. And open up and hence and solve the and seven devil's mind. And when we're down a hundred feet, Rich or on the dump, the money kings will all take hold and make the devils hump. And when we sell our minds of wealth, we'll have money boys to hold. We'll put plated harness on and visit all our friends. Then dig for us, dig, and let us rich or fine. And open up and handsome style the seven devils mine. For when a man has wealthy grown, past is all forgot. He's honored, petted, loved, and praised as though a drunken sot. And as we would our wealth, and as our wealth accumulates, ladies all will smile. We'll bid the devils a goodbye and live in splendid style. And then, boys, dig, let us the rich or fine. Open up and handsome style, the seven devils mine. just love to be around a campfire with that dude. <laughs> and needless to say, he was a bastard all his life. What a surprise. Okay. Uh, this is a 135 book, page book. Uh, has lots of songs, lots of poems, and had a bunch of essays too. To say he was a member of the Socialist slash Populist Party. Got elected to state office in Idaho back in the days. He definitely had political opinions, but he also had a real sense of humor. And this probably actually happened to him. Um, he had an encounter with a grizzly bear. And of course, he was going to document that in a poem or a song, right? Of course. That's what people did back then. If you look at those old newspapers, especially rural newspapers, uh, they very often have songs and poet poetry that was written by local people. Somewhere around 1910, most of that disappeared. And I think it was because of syndication, and even small towns like this town, does this town have a newspaper at one time? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was done. Yeah, I don't know if it survived in 1910, but uh, what happened in, 19, in 1910, so it's uh, even backcountry, uh, Small towns started pretending they were the Boston Globe or the LA Times or uh, you know the Washington Post or whatever, 
And for me, it became way less interesting. If you could read that stuff in any newspaper, but you can't find it local songs and poems and stories uh, in big city newspapers. So there were a few old curmudgeon grenade throwing editors like in Mackey, Idaho and Chalice, Idaho that uh, continued the tradition for a while, but most of it was gone. So here we go, Seven Devils Bear Fight by Animal F. Seven Devils Johnson. He was an Oregonian, by the way. <laughs> One morning in the month of August, Early while the air was cool, high up in the Devil Mountains wandered I in search of gold. Strolling onward, much delighted, with the rugged grandeur there, I in sudden horror sighted up the hill, a grizzly bear. Oh, I had the queerest feeling. I must have turned a little pale when I saw the grizzly sitting on his stubby tail. And I knew he saw the motion that was quickly made by me when I, with sudden motion, dodged behind a giant tree. Oh, but he my hiding place detected, and on he came with giant stride, with his battle flag erected, thundering down the mountainside. I saw his mouth wide open, and his fiery eyeballs glare. I thought the seven devil miners' time had come to say his prayers. Then I began to scratch the gravel in the grease with danger right, as round and round the tree we traveled, he for grub and I for life. <laughs> While the war was thus progressing, every nerve was brought to pay. Still, my mind was busy guessing which at last would win the day. When the bear would seem to leave me, dismal thoughts filled my mind. I knew when the space in front was widening, it was shortening up behind. <laughs> Then, with a superhuman effort, on I bounded in the charge, with despair and desperation, full upon the bear's rear guard. Then he surprised and I delighted. Bruin thought to change his race. Demoralized and much affrighted, he lowered his flag and left the place. Out of breath and much exhausted on the battlefield I lay, satisfied to be the victor, happy thus to win the day, Slowly I drew myself together on this bloodless battle plain, gathering up the scattered fragments, I wandered back to camp again. Although I'm fond of meat for dinner, I would wish it understood that for the seven devil miner, grizzly bear meat is no good. <laughs> Yeah, they're free, we know. At 
lived for many years in the state of Idaho. We were bound for Rapid River, we scarcely had a dime. It was just before the rush began, the weather it was fine. The snow, it was melting fast, the mud is to our knees. Before we reached the camp that night, I thought that we would free. You hear Rapid River, you take the golden fever. Got a pretty girl home, go right away and leave her. Saddle up your old coyotes and to the valley go it. If you strike a good thing, boys, let everybody know it. And he goes on and on. He gets up the sound meadows, you know where Blue Meadows is. Uh, the snow was over their heads and the, the Oregonians got lost. And, uh, you know, on and on, this one catastrophe after another until they got down uh, to lower ground. So that's the story about Seven Devils Johnson. Was there anybody like Seven Devils on this side of the canyon? I bet there are poets here. I know there are poets here. Our, the, our, our uh, trip is to try to find those guys. Okay. This is a uh, piece of sheet music. Once in a while I find an interesting piece of sheet music. I don't know anything about Anna B. Williams, the Wallowa County. Uh, I think it came from here, but uh, I don't, we don't know that much about this person. We did record a piano version of my good friend, Sean Rogers, who recorded it for me. I thought you'd like to hear what this piece of music from 1902 sounds like. Uh, there's another one called the Baker City March. If you're interested, I can play that one for you too. Uh, where are we here? Audio. I didn't saw a little audio.
This will call us march slash two steps back in the day. You can either march along or you can dance the two step too. So, um, one of the, um, yeah, I'll turn this thing off here. <laughs> one of the misconceptions uh, was that uh, the musicians out in, in the wild mining camps, um, were just goobers who just kind of hacked around. In fact, many of them were actually professional trained musicians. Many of them were classical trained musicians. And they were some of the few people that could reliably make money in those gold mining camps. You can guess what some of the other businesses were. But the, uh, the first business, this is that women usually were uh, well, mer mercantiles, but breweries and saloons. So uh, the saloons had to have people who could play music. There were some really interesting examples from Idaho about uh, who these musicians really were, and they're not who you might think they were. Okay, uh, let's move along here. This is a song, I've never performed this song before. Uh, this, but it's about an event that happened in the bottom of Hell's Canyon. There's a crusty old guy named Mac, uh, Mac Myers. Mac, yeah, Mac Myers, who um, say things by social would be underestimating it. And, uh, he got into a scrape with uh, some cowboys and wound up shooting one of them. And he was captured, and before he could go to trial, he was lynched. This was in 1904. And there's probably stories like that on this side of the river, too. So uh, shootings and things like that were not uncommon. Uh, so let's see if I can struggle my way through here. Matt Myers liked it best when his neighbors lived afar. And so he built a cow and Hell's Canyons at the bottom. Sweet as sour milk, that's what some folks said. Leave that man alone, or you could wind up dead. Cowboys water cattle in the creek next to Max. Sometimes there's Pepsi cattle in his garden for a snack. Mad as hell, Mac closed the trail. Trouble was sure to come. The cowboys laughed at Mac, but the old man had a gun. Cowboys can be hungry in the distant past. Men were tough and women too, as scores were settled fast. Cowboys on the neighbor's farm don't let your cattle grow.
tell me a story of school that's similar to that that happened, except for the lynching part. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm going to do two more things here, and then we'll uh, uh, have a little Q and A if you want. We can break out instruments and have a jam session. If you would like to get involved in this project, come talk to me. If you, uh, I know somewhere in this, in this area, there's a cedar chest up in somebody's attic that belonged to a great, great, great grandmother and with a bunch of papers in it. Uh, back in the day before electricity came, in the long winter nights, what did people do? Well, sometimes they sat around and they wrote poetry and they wrote songs and they wrote stories. Sometimes they just wrote. Uh, the coming of uh, radio put a big dent into that that uh, tradition, coming of TV, torpedoed it again, and now these things have just about killed the tradition. Now, there are a few people out there that still write, but there aren't a lot of them. So uh, let me, let me um, do another poem here that uh, Dave sent us to me. And May Oliver, she was a young woman too, right? She was the, the high school student? Teacher. She was a 22 year old, I think. Yeah, she was yeah. And she had a brother that uh, was a poet also. And here in uh, El uh, here? Yes. Okay. And this is called The Legend of the Hawaii's. Now, I, I, I started with a poem that kind of celebrated the uh, pioneers coming into this area. She's having second thoughts about the whole thing here and trying to look at it from the uh, point of view of the Nez Perce. It's called The Legend of Wallawa. Girt with Oregon's blue mountains, reaching high towards heaven's dome, lies a peaceful sunny valley. And this valley was the home of a tribe of happy red men. Here they go, secure in ease, falling with true enjoyment, crafts the native park with please. Now this tribe, by name the Josephs, seemed a peaceful band, yet they welcomed not the pale face to their pleasant sunny land. For they knew, should e'er a white man wander into that rich vale, a tide of immigration soon would follow in his trail. Could they see their native forest, now the home of Fawn and Doe, felled to earth in dire confusion by the white man's destructive blow? Time will tell. The lapse of ages brings full many a change in place, and its little tranquil valley soon must know a change of race. So when the haughty pale face suddenly, the slumbering band burst forth into warlike heroes fighting for their native land. Yet encumbered by their loved ones, they could not give blow for blow. So to save their wives and children, they surrendered to the foe. Yet beyond the Rocky Mountains in the Mississippi's Vale, there today you'll find the Josephs in the reservation's Vale. They'll resume their wanted bearing, never till their satchels found in that gold, the warrior's heaven, called the happy hunting ground. Visit now the wild Wallawa. There no more the braves are seen, decked in feathers, beads, and wampum, dancing on their native green. But you'll hear the plowboys whistle, Ere the sparkling dew is dry and the stroke of sturdy woodman ringing through the forest nigh. Down beside the rushing river, where the slender willows weep, where the quaking aspen quiver, lieth Joseph fast asleep. Wild war hoops shall wake him never, but the stream with ceaseless surge rolling on and on forever sings his melancholy dirge. <coughs> so, you have to go, sir. All right, thanks for um, coming tonight. Uh, I don't often get to play for a scanning room. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. 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 And thanks to Long Island Museum uh, for making this possible. Uh, I've been in literally every library, large and small, every museum, large and small in the state of Idaho in the last 20 years. 
there are hundreds and hundreds of them. And uh, you're lucky to have <laughs> a board here uh, that's, um, that has a vision for what this place could be. And this place is awesome. It's just absolutely, it's exactly the kind of place I look for to do, do these programs. And you go to a new, new library or something, it's just something sterile about it. And you can just kind of feel the history here, can't you? I was upstairs looking at the bunks. And Dave, one thing I noticed, those guys were a lot shorter back in the day. <laughs> they were my height were shorter. So, anyway, it's uh, support your local museums. Uh, they're doing good work. And if you're like me, uh, uh, you believe that there's something to learn from history. Now, not everybody believes that. But I believe that uh, we can probably avoid some stupid mistakes that we understand where we came from. All right, anybody know the story about the Copperfield Affair? Dave does. Everybody, everybody, everybody knows where Copperfield is, right? Down on Snake River, down Pine Creek. Just, just keep driving. Just keep driving east and you'll find it. So, uh, in 1913, uh, you would have found the wildest, craziest, uh, rough edge mining camp in the American West. It was so bad that the Oregon governor, I'm sorry, the uh, Baker, the um, Baker County sheriff and the, and the DA decided they weren't going to go near that place. But the, the first attempt to build a dam on, in Hell's Canyon failed, the Oxbow Dam. Uh, the copper mine at Copperfield failed, and therefore the railroad spur that came in from Huntington also failed. So suddenly you had 500,000 men there, time on their hands, uh, every vice known to man, readily available, and probably a little money in their pockets. But don't you know, somebody, there's always somebody that spoils a party. And somebody wrote to Governor, uh, Oregon Governor Oswald, who happened to be a rabid prohibitionist. This was 1913, right? The height of the anti drinking thing. Who shall not stand on my watch? I can hear him saying that or something like that. So, what did he do? He had this uh, executive secretary who was an amazing woman. Her name was Fern Hobbs. And from what I've read, she was about four foot ten, that might have weighed 85 pounds soaking wet. But she was a tough character. And she actually was the, um, uh, under the governor's, in the governor's office, the, what I read, the highest paid female in government in the, in the United States at the time. Wow. So she was, she had a law degree, you know? She was something else. So, so uh, she wrote in, uh, the governor sent her down there on the train with a couple of Oregon Marshals to, to declare martial law. So she uh, read, read the riot act to them. And you can imagine this, you know, hundreds of deep, drunk miners in a saloon. And, oh, 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 you and the horse you rode in. You can hear that, right? But by golly, they made it stick. And within a year, there was nothing left of, of Copperfield. They closed that place down. And it became an international story. And it was covered all over the world, you know. And, it has all the elements that are titillating, you know. Just what a great story. So I found a, a, a reference to a title of a song that apparently was played in uh, burlesque houses in Portland at the time. I, it's called I Could Live Forever with a Girl Like You from Copperfield. And I just know what that song was about, you know, and what it might have sounded like in the, in the um, saloons in Portland. But I could never find the, the music for it or the lyrics. So what are you gonna do? So you write a song, right? So it goes like this. But imagine I'm a like a five-piece wild burlesque hall band of you know, barrel house piano and the whole works. Well it's just one of me, so you get what you pay for. <laughs> Fighting, 
Hustling and gambling with sporting girls we love to play. I was as sure as I was born I could live with a copper field girl. But do good or roast to govern hawks. That teetotal son of a guy shut down the saloons, flush all the boots, chase sporting girls out of town. There to declare martial law. She read the act, left on the train, and the governor's marshals remain. I quick had to choose a good sporting girl, and I left off the field on the run. Play a slim.